welcome to Let's Talk Racism, a series of five shows about what systemic racism looks like around the world. I'm Amber Tate. We're all media production students from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. I'm Anna Ashute. Our other shows were produced by students from seven countries around the world. This one's a little different. Ever since the deaths of George Floyd and Bri Breonna Taylor earlier this year in the U.S. and the rise of Black Lives Matter movements around the world, we want to sit down and have a conversation about what racism in Canada looks like. As young Black women who look to enter the creative industries, we feel that it's important for us to address these topics from a first-hand perspective. We asked Asha Tomlinson to join us as our moderator. Asha is a well-known journalist with the CBC. She's known for her award-winning investigative journalism with the CBC program Marketplace. As well, she's been co she's co-produced and co-creator of the series Race Being Black in Canada, in which Asha closely explored the history and the realities of being a person of color in Canada. Thank you for joining us, Asha. Thanks so much. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here, to be your moderator for this very critical, this very important conversation. And as many of us know firsthand, really, based on our lived experiences, racism is so deeply rooted in the fabric, right, of Canadian history. It's manifested itself in so many aspects of our society. And the first question that I wanna throw out to all of you is why do you think it's important? Why do we need to have these conversations continually about Canada's history and its connection as it relates to racism and power in our country? I think why it's really important is because today we're seeing both the effects of racism historically and also the effects of racism as it presents itself in our day-to-day -day life. And we really just can't continue on with the way things are. It's so true. And you know, these are history lessons, let's face it, that aren't taught in school. Uh, they need to be because we need to know the entire fabric of our Canadian history and our identity, right? Uh, it's information that's not widely shared. It's not widely recognized. Uh, there are a lot of racism deniers in our country. I mean, many Canadians I know will look to the US and say, thank goodness we don't have racial divides like they do stateside, but what they fail to realize or maybe admit to themselves, I mean, do some reflection internally is that we have our own problems here. And even some of our Canadian politicians, as we know in recent months, have denied that systemic racism even exists in our country. Thank God that uh, we're different than the United States. And we don't have the systemic and deep roots they, they have had for years. So what do you think that says, that denial, what does that say about our nation as a whole? I mean, it's telling the audience that these issues against Black and Aboriginal people don't exist. And it's a prime example of how Canada likes to say, you know, like we sweep these issues under the rug and that it never happened, but it did happen and it is an issue and we need to talk about it. Yeah, I think um, covert racism, it's still racism, but that, that's the nature of it in Canada. It's that we're, it's, we're finding it more in institutions than in workplaces or in schools. And these are not situations where we have to really get into the fabric of what's going on in order for us to make change. So if we deny that there's a problem, we can't address the problem. Uh, there was actually a town in Nova Scotia and it was called Africville and it was the first black town and it was in 1965. And this town, they want, the government wanted to use it um, for, for gain and on the, on the town because it had, it was a really profitable uh, town. So they decided to, it was infected and then these people were displaced, the town went into ruins and it actually wasn't even addressed until 2000. So I feel like we're, 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 we're making headway, but first we need to address that there are problems happening and we need to go back into history and kind of pinpoint where they're happening as well in order to move forward. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, Anna. Just the denial of racism is racist. That's point blank. That's the issue there. That's part of the problem. And really just normalizing that these issues, that's not going to bring about any type of solution. Mm -hmm. 
Asha, we mentioned earlier that you produced a show called Being Black in Canada. What was the most important discovery you made while creating the show? Yeah, you know, I've been co-producing the show for quite a few years now. And honestly, every single year, I'm learning more and more about Black history in Canada. These, you know, this is content information that I wish I knew earlier. I wish that I was learning about it as I was growing up. It would really help shape who I am today in terms of my Canadian existence and identity and, and validation. Let's face it, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, but about four years ago, I spoke with three young, high profile, energetic activists. I'm sure you've heard of them, Sandy Hudson, Desmond Cole, and Cyrus Marcus Ware. And we talked about their activism and how it wasn't always supported, how they continue to receive pushback for what they were doing, but they were committed to the cause and they wanted to keep pushing for change no matter what. So we brought them back together this year in 2020 for the show uh, with this reckoning on race, of course, uh, and the movements that are happening internationally. And I got to tell you, I mean, they were so hopeful. It was inspirational for me because, you know, the looking at the conversation four years ago, it, you know, you, you, you tend to have a feeling of, is anything going to change? There's a bit of a resignation, if you will. You feel a bit deflated because how, you know, how much work needs to happen for people to see the problems and, and do something about it. So to, to hear from them and to hear just how inspired they were to see what they're seeing on the streets and in their communities, uh, they're on the front line. So hearing that really did give me a different perspective regarding the outcome of all of this and whether we're gonna see tangible, long lasting changes. Unfortunately though, after our program aired and it was posted on YouTube, I mean, I gotta say there was a lot of negativity, a lot of negative comments, a lot of racism deniers, a lot of hateful, vile things said, uh, but I gotta say that inspired our team more. And, and now we realize that this content is so important just for that very reason. Right. If we can continue to tell these stories and hear from these voices, uh, perhaps it'll continue to open minds. It might be one mind at a time, but at least we keep shining the light on these issues and hopefully addressing them so people can talk about it. That, that is the first step, talking about it and then moving forward with, with action. If you would like to know more about systemic racism in Canada and internationally, you can also go to our website. And if you've just tuned in, you're watching the Let's Talk Racism edition, and I'm Asha Tomlinson, joined by Ryerson students Anna, Amber, and Shay to discuss racism and the impact it has in so many of our lives here in Canada. There has been an ongoing discourse, as we know this year, about racism after the death of George Floyd. People all over are really having these open, these brutally honest conversations about discrimination, about social injustice, about privilege, about power. And there's a lot of talk about meaningful change. So many people wanna see it. So many people say, hey, how can I be a part of that? What kind of changes are you seeing around you now? Well, I've personally been really seeing some changes start with the education and how racism is talked about in schools. I know personally growing up, there wasn't much talk about racism. Um, maybe there was like the little bit of racism talk during Black History Month, um, but it was really spar sparring. And now there's just so much talk about racism in schools. So true. Uh, Anna, or what are you seeing? Yeah, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of people are calling for more cultural, cultural sensitivity in the classroom settings. Um, our fellow RTA uh, radio and television peer, Pranika Raj, she actually started a petition which got over 4,000 signatures for people to, um, for, for the curriculum, the Peel curriculum specifically in high schools, to adjust a course that would be about racism and about ethnicity and about inclusion and equity. Um, and we need this in our curriculum. I, I, in my undergraduate experience was the first time that I actually had a course on ethnicity and, and race. Um, and that's where I got to just understand about microaggressions, about navigating through the world as a black woman. And I never got that experience um, 
in, in, my, in, in elementary school or even in high school. So we do need to make these changes. Yeah, when I was in, you know, when I started university, I took a lot of courses on race and everything. And that's when I felt like I started to get a real grasp of, you know, culture and identity and really learning about these subjects because it's so important because in school, I felt like, especially in high school, elementary school, I felt like I never really learned that. And another um, call to change is actually ending academic streaming here in Ontario, which I think is a huge thing that needs to end. I agree. In case some of our viewers aren't familiar with academic streaming, it's when students are separated by their academic abilities. And what usually happens is that many students end up being discouraged from pursuing higher education like university early on in their academic career. And you know, I have to say, and just adding to that, uh, adding to how it impacts you as a young person growing up, right? I mean, my mother, I, I've got to give her some props here. She was always, you know, giving me black books, black dolls, even our angel at Christmas on top of the tree was black because she wanted, she wanted me to feel confident about who I am and, and see that representation because you couldn't see it anywhere else. And when I went to school, same kind of deal. I didn't see it until high school when, believe it or not, a white high school teacher created this program. It was extracurricular and it was after school hours, but it was about black history. And the, the classroom was packed. And I mean, that was really my first introduction to hearing about black history, Canadian black history in school. And it really did make a difference for me. Uh, and when we're talking about academic streaming, right, and, and guidance counselors and teachers, they're the ones directing young people toward their future. How do you think, though, academic streaming impacts young people of color and their future academic opportunities? Because it can really change the direction that they, that the path that they take. Yeah, well, in the Toronto District School Board, you know, academic streaming was supposed to be eliminated in 1999. So now we hear like, how come that hasn't ended yet? And we're here in 2020. And, you know, more minority students are put into applied courses going to college than university. And, you know, this really affects their likeliness to graduate and find opportunities in the future. You know, personally, for me, I went to school in the Toronto District School Board. And I always knew I want to go to university and you're supposed to make that decision in middle school, either applied or academic. And I chose academic and I was always more of the artsy kind of English student and not really a, a science or mathematical girl. Mm -hmm. And um, specifically in those courses, I had an issue where a teacher really encouraged me to take more of the applied mathematics because I wasn't doing that well in the course. and. I tried my best though to get through the term because I had a goal and she ended up failing me and later she told me she wanted me to go to um, summer school to learn more and that like honestly broke my heart because I felt like I was working so hard to get through that course and um, for someone to purposely fail you to feel like you need to be educated more was just horrible and that kind of just shows the lack of you know confidence and support you're seeing in schools to really go on to university and achieve great things. And I feel like that affects a lot more minority students. You know, Shay, I can relate to your experience. I was also impacted by academic streaming um, in my, um, my high school experience to the point where I ended up going into college and it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. I took a program that I, I wasn't passionate about. Um, and when I went back to school to just upgrade some of my marks, um, I'm now an RTA, I'm now on the Dean's list and I'm able to excel doing what I love. And, and so I think Asha, it's also having these teachers who take initiative to have these after school programs to see that there's opportunity for kids and, and for youth to learn in spaces that are without judgment and without pressure. Um, and once we start implementing that into everyday classroom settings in high school and in elementary school and in university, I think we can do a lot better with our educational system. Just for a minute more, what changes do you think need to be made to benefit students of color and help them succeed? Well, one thing is just updating the education system because it is a bit, a bit outdated. And you know, when I was in high school, we had lots of black clubs and just celebrating, you know, black and indigenous people and you know, having more of our stories written into the curriculum than having kind of just the set story from outdated textbooks. 
So I think that's where it needs to start and having more conversations like this in the classroom because it's important. There's also um, Afrocentric schools in Toronto. And I remember when uh, they proposed making the Afrocentric school in Toronto, there was a lot of pushback. And so the Toronto Star actually published an article uh, reflecting on 10 years later. And in the article, there was a student who mentioned um, that the, he was a graduate and he mentioned that having graduated from the Toronto Afrocentric school, he was able to be his authentic self. Um, and then that, that moment when he just said authentic self, it reminded me of how, what it's like to be hyper aware of, of being a person of color, even in, edu in, in elementary school. I remember we were, um, it was, I was in gym class. I was either in like grade four or grade five and we're sitting down and we're playing dodgeball. And uh, another one of my peers, she comes up to me and she said, you know, what does it feel like to be black? And I was like, oh, like, I don't know, what does it? And I met, that was the, the moment where I, I realized, not that I was black, but that maybe, oh, am I different? Is, is there something I should be feeling? How do I, and ever since then, in, in, in when I'm in school or when I was in school, I was always hyper aware of who I am and how I'm presenting myself. And so I can imagine that having an Afrocentric school or having a space where you don't have to be thinking about that. You can focus on your education and being who you are authentically uh, will, will relate in a higher success rate. And they're doing much better as far as the statistics of success in, in that school. I think just to jump in, if you look at the colleges um, in the States, like historically black colleges, I mean, they say the same things that you're uh, saying, Anna, is that, you know, it helps to be in an environment where you feel supported, where there are others like you, you can have those critical conversations and feel confident and comfortable in your skin. Well, just on the topic of what Anna was mentioning about, um, it seems like you're describing alienation in schools. And I feel like a lot of young black students that are in schools where they're clearly visible minorities or there's a high population of whites or others where they go, they walk around with that feeling of alienation every single day. Mm -hmm. And just having more guidance counselors, more teachers that are black, more professors that are black, so they really see themselves represented and they feel comfortable to express themselves. I think we really shouldn't even take something like an Afrocentric school. We should just have that inclusive culture so that um, young black students can feel like themselves in schools that everyone attends. I think that's a, a great way to look at it as well. Definitely, I agree with that as well, it's true. I, and that, that, that has to start, right? Th those hires have to happen and that's within the education system. It's on them, their responsibility, uh, the board, school boards to do that and to make it a priority. Shay, what do you think? I definitely think it needs to be a priority and we need to see more women and black women in these environments, you know, um, sharing our, our stories and that's my thoughts. Any more thoughts from Amber or Anna? Um, I would just say that um, while we are also, you know, like, like Amber mentioned that we should also include um, diversity when it comes to education and, and everyday schools, even if it's not a historically black college or an Afrocentric school. And I think we also need to have accurate data. Um, unlike the, um, the US in Ontario, we actually do not keep statistics of what students are being expelled. It, it's, it's not something that they have to do. And again, like the question Asha asked us, well, if we have, uh, if we don't have data or if we don't have the opportunity to know what's actually happening, how can we address that there's an issue at hand? We can't, right? And so there actually was an independent um, study that was released and it did find that um, black students, students of color were disproportionately uh, impacted by expulsion in Ontario. And so I think the next step would be for Ontario schools, the, the, the regions to expand when it comes to collecting data on race and ethnicity, because it's very important. That is all very, very true. Great insight there from all of you. Let's talk about the workplace now. In what way have you experienced racism while working? I do do a bit of modeling and I've noticed some change in that industry with involving more inclusivity. And, you know, if you hear stories from other models, they say, you know, we go in there doing our own makeup because, you know, makeup artists don't know how to match our skin tones with the foundation and bringing our own hair products. And 
when I was first getting into modeling, that was something I was a bit concerned about. But all the shoots that I've gone and done, you know, the hair and makeup artists have, you know, black hair products and the right makeup. And even if they don't, they ask you, hey, do you have this? Could you maybe bring it on set so we can use it? So I think that is a change I'm seeing and I hope to see in other places too. Um, but I haven't experienced racism personally, but maybe going on to into job interviews, I do make sure I'm more presentable looking, like not having my hair all, you know, big and curly, but having it more um, tamed and slicked back just to feel a bit more presentable. Cause I know some people may feel a bit intimidated by having huge curly hair. And I mean, that is something that black women has have faced historically is that European standard of beauty is, you know, we're told, well, having your hair straight is seen as more professional. They always use that word, right? Uh, or it can be a distraction if you have curls. Uh, but it is really great, I must say, to see the movement toward natural hair and natural hair care. I mean, it has exploded, I find, in even, let's say, the last 10 years that I've been seeing it and seeing so many black women on the streets, people I interview on air with like curly, big, beautiful hair. I think of Arissa Cox, host of, you know, Big Brother Canada. Anyway, I, I think it's great that you're, everyone is able to embrace that uh, for the most part. And we're seeing that shift really in what is beautiful hair. Remember the term good hair? Do away with that, right? Everyone's hair is good hair, no matter how they want to rock it. Uh, it's beautiful in every shape and way and shade. So I, I'm loving that, I must say. Uh, Amber, I what think do you think? In the, I think that it's great that we're appreciating our all different hair textures. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be a sort of bias when it comes to maintaining that professional hair. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's a societal a depiction of the ideal professional hair and it is somewhat slicked back or tamed and um, even though we're comfortable personally this is speaking for myself um, I've ever since COVID I've been embracing my natural hair and wearing more natural looking styles but I feel like that's only because I'm not really in a professional work environment and um, if I were to pursue a more corporate position, I would rethink that. And I don't like that. I'm just, I'm acknowledging it, but I don't necessarily think that that's the way how it should be. You know, Amber, um, you mentioned something that I can definitely relate to, which is um, that idea of, is this professional? I think a lot of the times before I leave to go out, if I'm going to school or if I was going to a job opportunity, but, you know, I'll ask my mom, you know, wait, is my hair, is it too much? Is it, does it look, I'll say, is it too much? And it's that secondary thought, it, it, it's, it follows us when we're walking in the street, when we're in different spaces, it follows us and it, it, it impacts our, our confidence. Um, but I am happy to see that right now there are a lot of black, beautiful women who are in media and Canadian media who are rocking their hair in all types of styles, whether it's straight, whether it's curly, wavy, whatever it is, it's a choice and not, um, a requirement as much anymore. You know, I have worked in workspaces where it was a requirement for you to have your hair pulled back and they would just have a conversation with, you know, with me on the side. And, and so those type of um, comments or even if it was microaggressions, like, is that how you plan on wearing your hair today? Uh, those kind of things can really impact us and impact our confidence while we're in workspaces. So I think we just need to be able to, to be who we are, to be confident in who we are and, and know that being diverse, even when it comes to our hair or our appearance is a thing to be celebrated and not limited. We gotta move on to the next topic, but just to add to that, Anna, I must say, I can tell you, you know, from the start of my career to now, I am seeing a change and you're right. I can only speak to the media industry, but you think of hosts like Tracy Moore who has rocked her hair in all sorts of ways. I mean, she was just in braids talking about race in her podcast uh, a few weeks back or even Kayla, Bra Kayla Gray, TSN host who rocked braids while she was hosting. It is changing. Uh, and so that, that is encouraging. I, I do think that there's a long way to go. Don't get me wrong here, but uh, definitely it's great to see more women who are confident enough to just, you know, do what they want with their look and, and how they feel, you know, in that particular moment. 
Uh, but having more BIPOC representation can be a step in the right direction. It does mean a seat at the table. It can positively influence others in the pipeline as, as we've been describing in the last few minutes. Why is advocating for equity though, diversity and inclusion, some you know, very big, broad, important words. Why is advocating for them, those, those things important in the workplace? I think um, ultimately representation is important because it means that you know, Shay, Amber and I, we can see people who in positions that we desire to be in. Uh, Asha, for example, you know, with the Being Black in Canada, um, work that you did. And I remember watching Marketplace with my mom years ago when we first started watching and my mom was like, oh, come, come, come see Asha on, on Marketplace. <laughs> and then it's just to even be speaking with you now, it's it's important for us to know, okay, there are there are women of color who are in these positions, who are creative, who have a journalistic, journalistic integrity when they're out on the field. It's important for us to know that we can do it and that we um, to not limit ourselves, like the academic streaming, to think beyond maybe any limitations that have maybe be set in place. Um, in the case of Ryerson University, actually there's a professor named Christine Brown, and she has a position as a lecturer in the field of media, and many students looked up to her for her accomplishments. Yeah, and Professor Brown is the first Black female to be nominated for directing a feature film in Canada, which is amazing. Yeah. But when her contract was not renewed, many students decided to rally behind her and, so, and to go against the faculty's, faculty's decision. Uh, Professor Brown is now working back at Ryerson again because of their activism. Uh, Ryerson's independent um, newspaper, The Eye Opener, actually has the full story and covered the expose. It's a really great story. And I'm so glad that many Ryerson students were able to get involved. If you guys would like to read more about Christine and the Ryerson students' involvement, you can check out our website. There are many initiatives um, that companies are putting in place to end racism in the workplace. I know some of my friends who you know, are still working within this pandemic saying that they're having these conversations on the Zoom call about you know, what racism in the workplace looks like and, and how we can you know, do better and make change. The city of Toronto has the um, anti-Black racism unit and it's dedicated to creating a more inclusive culture in the workplace. The term anti-Black racism was actually coined by a professor here at Ryerson, Akua Benjamin. I know that Bell Media and other larger companies, they have networks for Black professional, professionals, which is really great. Yeah, actually um, there's initiatives at CBC this summer because internships were impacted due to COVID they decided to do a series, it was a J School series uh, for, for up and coming journalists. And some of them that I attended, uh, we got to learn more about um, being ethical in, in, in the workspace and some of the initiatives specifically that CBC is doing. And so there are a lot of workspaces um, and initiatives in the workspace that they're putting together. And they're also trying to push them out on uh, virtually, which is really great for us to access as students. You're watching Let's Talk Racism, a panel discussion moderated by Asha Tomlinson from CBC in Canada. You know, social media, it's become a powerful communication tool to advance these critical conversations on race. How are you seeing it used as a form of activism? You know, especially since the start of the pandemic and everything going on in America and the Black Lives Matter movement, you've seen a lot more people take a stand on social media and use their voices to really educate people on um, different concepts and everything. And, you know, supporting more black owned businesses and, and companies and calling out people for cultural appropriation who might not even know that they're doing it. I think social media is really important right now, especially with young people, because that's where so many young people are. And social media is really great because you're able to spread messages really quickly in a way that's palatable to young people. So they can really, they're able to absorb these messages. It makes sense to them. Uh, Amber, um, actually Desmond Cole is using the power of social media to spread his message very quickly. Um, he was walking down the street in Toronto one day and he saw a young black man who had actually called the police for help and 
seven police officers tended to him and unfortunately he was arrested. And so Desmond Cole recorded everything and put it on YouTube. And the comments that he was getting from the police officers, like you need to educate yourself, you need to do this. It, it, it was so raw. And I feel like having social media is allowing us to be able to bring forth things that might have happened in the quiet. Uh, we're bringing them to light. And I think it's really important that we're using social media as a tool. Yeah, for sure. Especially sharing those stories that, you know, if social media didn't exist, you would never see. So people sharing that is super important. And especially there's some people out there who do performative activism, which is like posting on their feed for the matter, but they're actually not really involved. They're kind of just doing it for themselves or to look in a certain way. Um, and I believe you said something on Tim Hortons and, and their doll adder campaign, something like that. Uh, so Tim Hortons actually, they put out um, a Barbie doll and it was to get young girls, you know, hockey is Canada's number one sport, to get young girls enthusiastic about playing hockey. Uh, and they actually put out one Barbie doll and she was a white Barbie doll. And then later they actually stopped production quickly and decided to release a secondary Barbie doll who was which, which is black. And if you go to your Tim Hortons now, you can see that there's two Barbie dolls. Um, but, you know, it, while we're happy that they did correct the wrong, it does make us question, you know, why does it take um, people question, putting you that pressure in order for you to make the change um, before something's actually done? And it, I felt it, some people are seeing that it feels a little bit performative just to be up with the times. Definitely. Hmm. Asha, as a journalist, how are you using social media to stay informed with initiatives and also use your voice? Well, you know, uh, so many jur journalists in my circle uh, have been lifting the veil and being open and honest about the racism they're experiencing in the workplace. So that's been an eye opener, sort of keeping me in the loop of what's going on in my circles, in my industry, uh, as well as, you know, there's a feeling of solidarity and relief that people are speaking up and speaking out about it and hopefully uh, it leads to some change. But I also use social media to post a really personal and intimate essay about what George Floyd's death meant to me as a new mother of a black boy. Uh, and that was really difficult to do. Um, but I understood the importance of it. You know, I felt that we needed to amplify these conversations. So many black parents as well said, that that's those are the things I think about all the time. These are the conversations I have to have with my children. Um, you know, even white uh, parents and and other people of color would reach out and say thank you for that. Uh, it really opened my mind to to the kind of things that we have to go through as as black parents, as as black Canadians. So just changing that discourse, right, and bringing awareness to the systemic problems that exist, uh, it it makes a difference. It really does. Um, just a small, you know, step, but it does make a difference, I find, just to have those conversations and to have people reaching out uh, to each other. But what are some of the examples of how you are all using social media to bring attention to these issues? Yeah, I mean, um, since the death of George Floyd, um, I've seen a huge spark on social media on, you know, the devastation of it and people sharing, um, you know, which movements and organizations to donate to. And I noticed a lot of it was American and of course it's important, but being in Canada, there was no way I can access those. So on my platform, I was really sharing black owned businesses in Toronto where I live and, you know, from bookstores to clothing and, you know, black programs like um, the Black Film Festival here and, you know, things that people here can be Part of and organizations they can donate to here because there is an issue here too. We need to pay attention to that. There it is, Shay. Um, more than ever, Black-owned businesses, especially in Toronto, need our help um, because COVID-19 has been really detrimental to a lot of small businesses and a lot of these um, brands uh, that, that I support on Instagram specifically, they'll reach out to you, you'll meet somewhere and they'll drop off your stuff and it's beautifully packaged, but because of social distancing, it is a little bit different. Uh, so having um, blog writers, Canadian blog writers who are writing about, you know, 10 amazing uh, people of color and black owned businesses to support, it really helps me to be able to, you know, do my part, uh, support with um, even signing petitions like uh, Pernika's petition for uh, education change in, in Toronto. 
those are things that I can do in social media and be involved in order to actually make a change. Why do you think it is important to speak up and speak out right now? Well, I think one thing is, is that us, uh, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color really need to use our voices now. So that way we're not misrepresented, you know, when it comes to things like telling our stories to the media and in TV shows and everything, especially in Canada, because our voices aren't heard at all. And I think it's really important to speak up now to move into a direction of change. Yeah, it is. Um, and also like initiatives like uh, The Skin We're In, that beautiful documentary by Desmond Cole, he actually even states that it feels sometimes like an occupation for people of color to constantly be speaking on their trauma. And we need to expand these conversations for everybody to be able to collaborate together. And um, Nick, there's a TED Talks by Nikki Sanchez about decolonization is for everyone. And that's calling everyone to take responsibility for having conversations like this, listening when we maybe don't understand and just opening up playing fields uh, so that we can all do our part to move forward in Canada. Mm -hmm. Amber? I really agree. I, I know that for people to be able to really hear a message, they have to hear it at least three times. And um, since racism is just so engraved into our culture, we just need to keep getting the message across. And it could mean something as simple as just sharing posts with your network, as we've all mentioned that we've been doing. Um, it's just really important to get the message to stick whatever way that it does. So speaking up is really important right now. Um, Asha, as a Canadian journalist, why is it important right now to speak up? You know, it's a nerve wracking process because as a journalist, you're supposed to be objective. The story should not be about you, but I've constantly, you know, told my colleagues and, and my superiors that being black is my identity and my lived experience. I can't change that. That is who I am and I'm proud of it and confident, but uh, there's nothing partisan as well about racism. You can't be impartial. You can't be balanced about these issues. So we need to talk about it. We need to be uh, subjective and tell the stories like they are, despite the trolls and attacks I've received. And trust me, I've uh, there's been a deluge, but I will always feel strongly about this, these issues. I will continue to report on them. And just the hope, you know, the reason why I do it is just the hope that it'll like I've said, change minds, start conversations, lead to something bigger and better, hopefully, for your generation and beyond, right? Any final thoughts? Just thank you for the seed that you planted um, with Lean Black in Canada, everyone who you, you reached out to and allowed to just sit there and really just speak raw, unfiltered. It was so powerful. And thank you for doing that for us as content creators, future uh, content creators now, but future content creators for later as well. Oh yeah, I look forward to seeing what's in store for all of you. You're beautiful the way you are. I love being able to talk to you and to share this platform with you and just uh, keep shining. Thank you. Thank you. And that just about wraps up our show. Thank you for joining us on this segment of Let's Talk Racism. I'm Asha Tomlinson, take care. You can watch this show and our other four shows on our Facebook, YouTube, and also on our website. Thanks so much, Asha, for taking part. And from Anna and Shay and I, goodbye.